Thank you, just in case. Okay, so we agreed on eight inch for the concrete slab. And the way that we have done it, we looked at uh, this pan and then we start to think about what's gonna be a good thickness to use for the concrete slab design for the project. And when we looked at this example that we use, we say 10 inches for a span of 14 feet. Anyone recall the span for this project slab? Nine feet? It's roughly nine feet. This is correct. Yeah, it is roughly nine feet. Yeah, so it's 28 divided by three. So we said uh, for 14 feet, I used uh, 10 inch thick. How about for nine feet? So you said maybe eight inches can do the job. All right. So I'm going to say for this concrete slab, it's going to be eight inch thick. And it's right there. You see this? Okay. We say it's going to be eight inch. So let's keep this. I'm going to put the box there so that we remember what we have considered. All right. Any more questions? Uh, Professor, I have a question. Yes. Um, so I was going based off your example when I was doing the project. Uh, when I saw for MU is the L, would that be 26 uh, inches or would it be the 9.33, the span of the slab? L, by definition, L, that's a very good question. L is the span. Where is the span here? What is uh, the symbol for the span? Do you know? No. It, it should be L. This is what we call the span. This is a span. The span is the distance from a support to a support. So it says here, over a span of 14 feet, this could be the distance from one support to another support, right? Support of this lab. So in, so terms, in, of, your, so in terms of the project, it would be 26 feet, 26 inches per feet, I mean. Um, now, let's look at the statical system for this lab. This lab is a continuous structural member the trans between supports. Now, where's support of this lab? I'm gonna say here's the first support, second support, third support, fourth support, right? And so on. So the span here becomes 28 feet divided by three. It's gonna be 9.33 feet. So okay. your span, which is L in this case that you're gonna be using in your analysis, this L is gonna be 9.33 feet. So it is not 26. 26 is gonna be the span of this beam the span of this beam, right? Not of the slab. The slab is span from here to there. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's what I wanted. Yeah, absolutely. And be sure, please, I want you to go and just watch the lecture again. It is recorded already. When you watch it, you're gonna find out lots of the answers, right? Lots of these answers. I just, I don't want you to feel that, oh, I don't have any source information. No, you have it. You have it in your slide set. And if you have trouble with this, just please watch the lecture again. It should be very helpful to you. Okay? Uh, professor, uh, yeah. I know in class in the example, we did the bottom re reinforcement, but yes. how would we do uh, the top reinforcement? It's going to be exactly the same steps, right? The difference is moment is going to be different, right? It's going to be based on the diagram I gave you, right? Here's the moment value. And the reinforcer, when you put it, is giving the top of the slab. It's giving right here. The reinforcer for the bottom uh, was right here. We put oh, it yes. here. Okay. But the analysis gave be exactly the same. As if, let's say that you have a section like this, right? Here's my section for the slab. I'm going to put here neutral axis. I'm going to put here. Now, where's the compression? Compression top or bottom? For the passive moment, for this case. You see, in this case, on the top is giving compression. On the bottom right, we're gonna have your C. On the bottom, we're gonna have the tension. Okay, now I understand this is what you call your passive moment, right? It's gonna be compression here and tension here. Now, where do you put the reinforcing? I'm gonna say, I'm gonna put the reinforcing here. Just imagine that this is gonna be a reinforcing, but I'm gonna put it here right here on the bottom, right? It's gonna be like this in the section. Now, when you have negative moment, I'm gonna redraw this again, right? And put this. Yes, okay, now let me handle this negative moment. What's gonna happen? Neutral axis is gonna be here. Why? Because compression is gonna be at the bottom, right? And tension is gonna be at the top. Now where's the rebar? The rebar, the main rebar that I need to put there 
is Gibeon dot up. Give you something like this. Okay. But the steps and all the analysis give you exactly the same. No, when it comes to the amount capacity, you can change it. You can change the spacing here or the rebar size. Try to stay with the number four, number five, number six. So you can play with the bar size. The spacing also, it would be good if you match them, but also you can change the spacing if you want to. For example, you can go with number five at 14 on the top, number five at 12 at the bottom if you want to. This is why I said, try to use your spreadsheet to do all the trials yourself before you start to do your business, right? Before you start to say, here's my final answer. Because here you do like a real design. You're not just answering like an exam question or homework question. When we're calculating the, the area of steel, the minimum area of steel, would we add both of our sets of rebar together to come up with AS minimum or is it in yes. each case? You are absolutely correct. This gave you top and bottom reinforcing. Okay, thank you. Yeah, but this is different from the other uh, minimum steel that used for beams. The one that we used for beams was only for the tensile reinforcement. This one here that we are doing for this lab, the 0 0.0018, right? Which right, is the, this one here, this gave you for the entire, um, for all the reinforcing top and bottom at one given section. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Okay, all right. So here's a negative moment, here's a positive moment. Same steps, exactly same steps. Okay, I want also you guys to know that just to remind you with what you have done here. Uh, when we said here, we're gonna be taking this 12 inch slab strip width, you can say 0.233 square inch per foot if you want to, or you can just eliminate this per foot because you know that your width is gonna be 12 inches. So you can just disregard this per foot if you want to in your announcement. But if you wanna keep this per foot, so be sure also when you take this AS per foot, that the tension also is gonna be per foot, and the moment is gonna be also per foot, right? This moment also is gonna be per foot. It's gonna be kept foot per foot. Why? Because you consider only 12 inch width of the slab. Does this make sense to you? All right. New subject, any questions now on your submitting? And that the roof has essentially the same plan as the floors, right? In regards to the beams and girders. Yeah, same layout. This is correct. So this pain is gonna be the same, right? This gonna be the right. difference, gonna be only in the loading. Life load is different and did load is also different, right? Is it did load different? Let me check. I mean, yeah, if we go with the same slab thickness, it's the same self weight and the additional. You tent. have the same addition of did load? Okay. If you have the same addition of did load, it means did load is gonna be the same for both the roof and the typical level. Life load is gonna be different. For the roof is gonna be only 20, right? For the floor is gonna be 65. You just add this two together. All right, now let's move to T-beams. I'd like to do first T-beams, right? Standard beam is gonna be like a T-beam. It's gonna be most like, like this. Yes, uh, to answer Eddie. Yes, this is correct. The rebar size is gonna be somewhere between number four, number five, and number six. No problem. Any other questions before I move forward to this? I will be sure that I covered you with the slab reinforcing and your project submit. So you don't struggle and you don't wait to the weekend to ask me a question and then you don't have time then. I will be sure that you are covered. The spacing, I wouldn't go 24 inch. If you guys are listening well to me, I wouldn't go 
24 inch, I'd go maybe maximum 18 inch. So maximum spacing is gonna be 18 inch. You can go 16, you can go 14, you can go 12. Don't go 13, don't go 15, don't go 17. This is gonna be a common number when it comes to construction. You like even numbers. Go 10, 12, 14, 16, 18 max. Don't go more than 18. So the spacing, we're not gonna say, it's gonna be minimum 24 inches spacing. No, actually it's gonna be maximum 24 inches spacing. You'd like to get closer. You don't want the rebar to be at each two feet. No, this is gonna be too much. So we call this the maximum spacing, not the minimum spacing. Okay, so here's a typical. We're gonna have usually a T-beam. So the T-beam is gonna be like this beam here and part of the flange that we'd like to consider. And the strength of this rectangular beam, if you consider your rectangular beam versus a T-beam, right? This flange that you add there, which is a slab thickness, right? This piece in this side, let's say this piece of it, and this other piece. And this is gonna be adding a little bit of a strength. And can you please give me a second? So adding this flange is gonna increase the strength of the beam. This is what you need also to keep in mind because you are given, um, you are giving here more like concrete section to it, right? So here's the section and the question is how much is gonna be the effective flange width? And if you notice here, when I'm doing here the rectangular section, I took the slab with it. I didn't do it this way. And I want you guys to know exactly what I'm doing. This is not the rectangular section of the beam. If you like to disregard or ignore the flange, you need to consider the entire depth, right? You don't, you don't take it here and then you say here, here's my flange. No, it is not done this way. If you like to ignore the flange, you just do your rectangular section like this. Let's give you your entire depth of the beam. So I'm gonna go here. Now I would like to study the parameters that I have in my beam design. Total width of the flange, I'm gonna call it here B. And the web width is gonna be BW. If you remember in the previous analysis, we called this to be B, but now we're gonna call it here BW and B is gonna be the effective flange width. Now, how do you come up with this? Most likely it's gonna be given to you, but also the code would have some say in there. I mean, this is how you determine the flange width, the effective flange width. We're gonna be going through this. So the same equations, there's nothing different. It's just gonna be the, I'm gonna say here's some tricks that you need to learn how to handle T-beam versus rectangular beam, but no change in the equations and finding out the strain and the stresses and the moment is gonna be exactly the same. So this is exactly the same. Now I'm looking here at one of these T-beams, right? Now I'm gonna be determining A. You remember how we start our business usually? If I may go back here to one of those slide sets, right? So if you recall the way that we're doing one of our examples, we started by setting tension equal to compression and then finding out A. And after A, you find the C, and then after that, you find the moment. I'm gonna take you here to one example. In this example, if you recall, what you have done, we were able to find out the compression block depth A. After that, we did the C, and then we find out the strain in the steel. We confirm it's gonna be more than the yield strain, which means the steel has been yielding already. And then after that, we find out the fee factor and then the mom. Now let's see what's gonna happen here. So item number one, find out the compression block depth. I have more than one scenario. When I do it, if the neutral axis gonna be right here, I'm gonna say, then now let me look at the stress distribution. Now it's gonna be 0.85 web prime C over the entire depth. So look here at the block distribution for the stresses. Look at this. Okay, I said, well, it means at the end, I'm gonna have one big compression force and one big tension force. But if you have big compression force for this area here, or for this prism, where is gonna be the centroid of it? Where is the CG of this shape? You're gonna say, well, 
it's gonna be tough. I need to find it out. So we said, why don't we split this into two sections for the compression? I'm gonna say, let me split it into two sections here, right? One is gonna be for the top, which means the force on the flange only, and the other one's gonna be the force on the web. So the force on the flange, I'm gonna call it C sub F, and the force on the web is gonna be C sub W. Now, this could be much easier, right, than just finding out one force in here. But if you decide to find out one force, it's gonna be equal to the entire volume that here you're looking at, all right? It's gonna be one big force here, C, which is gonna be equal to CF plus CW. So it's gonna be up to you. But just to make it easy on yourself, just do it as two forces. Now this force, CF, is gonna be equal to the entire width, the big flange width, applied by two inches, in this case, in this example, and this two inches give you the flange thickness applied by 0.85 F prime C. So finding C W is gonna be easy. If you are sure about this neutral axis depth, if you think that now I'm done with it, I know exactly what's gonna happen there. You say C W equals is gonna be equal to this 10 inch, which means B W times this value here. I'm gonna be calling it A sub two, right? Times 0.85 F prime C. Also, you need to know that C F plus C W is gonna be equal to the tension force. So the equilibrium condition still applies. So I can say here T equals C F plus C W, right? And to find out the moment, I guess I'm gonna say usually I say the moment equals to T multiplied by this Z value. In this case, I'm gonna have here two forces. If I said, let me take the moment about the tension force, like what I have done here. Let me take you back to this example to show you that actually what we have done here, we have taken the, uh, the moment about the tension force. Let me do it here. Yeah, in here is good. So I'm gonna say, if I wanna take the moment about this tension force, what's gonna happen for all of these two forces? I'm gonna say this moment equals, I'm gonna put it here, the equation. Now take the moment about this tension force is gonna be equal to this compression force. You can see is equal to C. And what is C? You can say, in this case, it's gonna be equal to T, but I'm gonna call it C for now. C times this depth from here to there, which is D from here to there is gonna be D. You can say D minus A over two. And I know that C is gonna be equal to T. So I'm gonna say this also equals, I can put it this way, I'm gonna say M equals to tension times D minus A over two. But the way it works that I have taken the moment about the tension force for all the forces in the compression sense. And this is the equation I keep using. So I said, how about here? I'm gonna be taking the moment about this tension force. So I'm gonna say, CF times, uh, I'm looking for this distance, I'm gonna call it here ZF, plus CW times ZW. Okay, this gave you also the moment. So I said, okay, it's gonna be the same equation, but this here simpler, and instead of finding out just one force for CF and CW, and finding out the centroid, just easier when you do it this way. So, okay. So this is gonna be one option. The other option, if I did my analysis and let's say the depth of the neutral axis starts to be like inch and a half. Now, do we have this distribution? We don't. And in this case, it's gonna be like a rectangular section because compression is gonna be only on the 32 inch by A, which is smaller than two inches, gonna be maybe one and a half inch times 0.85 A prime C. And in this case, the analysis of this T section is gonna be exactly like rectangular section. There is no change. Does it make sense? Yes, no? I'd like to hear from you guys. Makes sense to me. Okay, all right, thank you. So let's do an example. In this example, I have a given section. The top is equal, the flange width is equal to 32 inches. Concrete is 3,000. 
three days of strength is gonna be six K side. I have three number nine at the bottom. Depth the tension rebars is gonna be 12 inches. And the width here is gonna be 10 inches. Slab thickness is gonna be two inches. And I need to find out three men, which means do complete analysis of that section. I don't know exactly where the neutral axis is gonna happen. I don't know how much is this A. I have two options. A could be here, right? Which means this could be your neutral axis or it could be here. If the neutral axis happened the top flange, it means that you have a rectangular section and this is giving the area exposed to compression. That's it. Now you're done with your NS. It's gonna be the same as a rectangular section. And in this case, we don't really call it T section. But if the neutral axis is gonna happen with it, the whip, I'm gonna have two forces. Like exactly what I have showed here. I'm gonna have your two forces. Now, so let's see. The depth equal to 12 inches. You don't need to subtract. You don't need to say H minus anything because that was given already to you. For AS, it's gonna be three times for number nine, cross section area for number nine is gonna be one square inch. So it's gonna be three square inches. So now this is good. I have your AS. At the beginning, I'm gonna assume that the steel is yielding. Same as what we have done in the rectangular section. So in this case, I can use this equation. It's gonna be AS FY divided by 0.85 A prime C times B. Where's the three coming from? I'm gonna say this is gonna be the three square inches. AS. 60, assume that Y. I am assuming here that the steel is yielding already. Divided by 0.85. What is the three coming from? Can someone help me here? Three, what three? Uh, PSI of the concrete. Yes, strength of the concrete, thank you. And now it says divided by 32. Well, why 32? Why not 10 inches? 10 inches at the bottom, but here's giving 32. You yeah, see, because compression is giving the top. So compression, if it happens to be within the flange, right? If the, the whole thing is gonna be within the flange, you start the compression from the top. So location of neutral axis is gonna start like here, go deeper, it's gonna be here, here, for all of us, gonna be 32 inch. And then once it comes here, it's gonna be kind of confusing. Which width to use? So I'm gonna say, well, let me start first with 32 inch and see where is this taking me. So I'm gonna say 32 inches come from here. Now the depth for the new the compression block, it says here's 2.2, just the A itself, not the C. You know, C is gonna be deeper, right? 2.2 means compression block depth is gonna be about here. Which means I really have here a T section. This is not a rectangular section. But this calculation, when I say this is gonna be 2.2, I have here an assumption that the entire width of the compression flange is 32 inches. But this is not true. For the first two inches from the top, it has a width of 32 inch. And for 0.2 inch, right? Because I have it here 2.2. So the first two inch is gonna have a width of 32. For the bottom 0.2 inch or quarter of an inch, I have a smaller width. So it doesn't happen this way. So actually this calculation is not accurate because this calculation here assumes that I'm gonna have a flange width or the width of the beam is gonna be like for the whole 32 inch. So I said something's wrong here. I need to revise my calculations. Now I understand that we're gonna have here two compression forces, right? One is giving the top, which is giving here. And the second one is giving the bottom, which is right here. The first one, you cannot really change it because slab thickness is gonna be two inch. This is gonna be 32 inch, right? So I know it's gonna be there. I'm gonna call this CF, compression force in the flange. The bottom one, C web, is gonna be a little bit different. It is not gonna be the way that I'm gonna calculate out based on point two. Maybe it's gonna be a little deeper. Why? Because if you like to compare this assumed cross-section area, I'm gonna change here the color. And let's say put it in, uh, put some tail. Right? 
right? Phase of my analysis is gonna be like this. It's gonna be the entire debt, 2.2. But you need to take care of this business here. This is an area here that doesn't exist. There is no concrete here to take this compression, which means the actual depth, right? Is gonna be slightly higher, right? Than your calculated A. Because this area here, you see this white area, is gonna be equal to this shaded area on this side and this shaded area on this side. Let's see how can we do this in the analysis. Here's the two forces, CF and CW. Based on my analysis, I said that this is gonna be 2.2, right? All the way to here. But this is here is gonna be composed of two areas. Area one is gonna be in the top, this box, right? I guess I should be able to remove this, right? So area one is give you the top flange and area two is give you the bottom, which means right at the way. Area one is constant, it's gonna be 32 times two inches. It's gonna be 64 inches. Area two now, this becomes like my variable. I don't know exactly how much this is gonna be, but I know it's gonna be equal to A2 multiplied by 10 inch. Okay. And both of these two forces are gonna be equal to the tension force, which is AS times FY. All right, here is CF. If you like to put an equation, it's gonna be 0.85 F prime C times A1. Same thing for C web. Gonna take you back. Here is A1, A2. A1 goes with the flange, A2 goes with the web. Both of them they're gonna multiply by 0.85 F prime C. So, okay, here's the two forces: 0.85 F prime C times A1 and times A2. As I said, the top one, this area is constant. This is gonna be 64 square inches, and F prime C is gonna be 3 KSI you end up with 163.2 kips. So this force is kind of fixed. It's not gonna get affected. Whether I have the neutral axis calculated correctly, like here, or kind of approximate, like in the top here, a little bit higher, it doesn't matter because I know that the entire flange is gonna be exposed to some compression force. Okay, this is now done. It's gonna be fixed. My problem actually is gonna be about this A2. I don't have this A2, the lowercase A2, I don't have it. So the one way to do it is to say T is gonna be equal to CF plus CW. I have the tension force, it's gonna be 180. Where do I have this from? I'm gonna say three square inches times 60. So I have here 180 equals to this force plus CW force. Okay, let me put it now. CW. It's going to be equal to 0.85 F prime C times the second area, which is equal to the tension subtracting CF. Why is that? Because tension equals CF plus CW. Here is a force. The tension is going to be constant, one fixed value, and the force of the flange is going to be also constant, end up by 16.8 kips in the web as a compression force. Now, take this value, set it equal to 0.85 F prime C times A. Now you have this value here, you have it, right? Like numerical value, difference between the two forces. And in here, you have only one variable left, which is A2, because the prime C is gonna be equal to three. Okay, so now let's take it here. Here's the area again, repeating it, right? Equals 0.85 times three KSI times A2, which is the same as this 16. 0.8 kips. I guess now you should be able to solve for A2. Your A2 is giving you now 6.6 .6 square inches. The width is how much? How much is the width? I said the width is 10 inches. The bottom, the width is 10 inches. How much is this A2 now? It's giving you 0.66 inch, right? So take this area, divided by the width B, it's gonna get you the depth A2. If this is gonna be here 0.66, how much is the total depth from here to there? It's gonna be 2.66 inches. Any questions? Finding out this A2 and the two compression forces. Angel, any questions, Angel? Blake? Yeah, the 60 came from the problem statement where you multiplied the the area of steel times 60? Very good question. Look at this here. 
usually we assume that the steel first is healing, right? Yeah. So I'm gonna take here the tension force three times 60. Three square inches for AS times 60, yield the strength. Mm -hmm. yes, I can yeah. look at, at it here, right? Three square inches, right? Times 60, okay, psi for the yield of strength. Yeah, got it, thank you. No problem. Any other questions? Uh, could you remind me what is the 0.85? Where do we? How do we arrive at that value? I know it's been given. On here. Yeah. Okay. No, no, no problem. Can I take you back here to one of our slides? In this witness block, we used to have this stress distribution with the maximum of prime C. So this guy he came in the past and he decided to make a simple block simple stress distribution. So it said, the stress here is gonna be 0.85 of prime C only. And the depth is gonna be equal to A, compression block depth. And with that, I'm gonna have a simple compression block applied on the top of the B. So this is where it came from. I see, thank you. It's just the kind of accepted mathematics to simplify. Yeah, because it's gonna give you the same compression, total compression force and the same neutral location of the force relative to the centroid of that section. Okay, thank you. No problem. What is the difference of the 2.2 and the 2.66? Is the 2.66 the correct value? Do you know why it is 2.2? Just for curiosity. Do you know what's coming 2.2? Yeah, I That's know. That's the reason. Okay. So do you know why I was able to get this 2.66? Can someone here help me by justifying the 2.66 versus 2.2? Yeah, the, if, could you go to the other slide? Next. Uh, the one where you drew the blue area, yeah. So the 2.2, um, the depth of the flange is two inches only. So the 0.2 goes into the, the rectangular section, the web, this one. and yeah. And then in order to account for those areas that happen on either side of the web. Yeah, actually you a need beam. to take them and put them here. Yeah, and that's where the two points. Very good, excellent, very good, thank you. So uh, I guess the way to do it, that you need to find out the difference between the tension and compression, right? Because you have your two forces. Uh, Eddie, do you have a microphone? Okay. Just trying to understand what you want to say here. Um, yeah, if you assume that the whole flange is going to be 32 inch, it's going to be continuous 32 inch, right? As the first assumption, you're going to end up with 2.2. But because the section here is changing to 10 inch, you're going to say this is not true because the force is not applied really over this section, it's applied only on this section, then after that it's gonna be applied on another section, which is a two inch. So the way that we do it, we know that I'm gonna have here two forces. So I simply can say tension equals this plus this, right? This two inch is fixed number. I cannot change it, but this A2, this is the one that I'm gonna be after. I'm gonna say in this case, I'm gonna say here, the tension force equals CF plus CW. CF is also constant value because equal to 0.85 F prime C times this width times two inches. So CF is good. I have no problem with it, right? I'm gonna put a box around it. The second one is the tension force. It's gonna be AS times FY because usually assume the steel is yielding. So I'm gonna say this one also, I have numerical value for it. I have numerical value for it. both of these two, CW, I guess I should be able to figure out the numerical value for it. And this CW equals to what? It's gonna be equal to, I'm gonna put it here. CW equals to A2 times 0.85 F prime C times. B, the width B, the 10 inch, which is A2. 
I found it. Let's just take this out. What do you do after that? Now, CW, we have numerically from here. 0.85 A prime C is giving you a stress value. Now you can solve for A2. Now, what do you do after this? You say AW equals A2 lowercase times 10 inch. Inch because it's giving the width, this give you a2. Put that figure out this a2 as 0.66 inches. Now let's look at it here. First, the CF is giving you like a constant value, as we say. CW is giving you the difference between the two between tension and this compression, turned to be 16.8 equals to a2 times 0.85 prime C. With that, I have my a2 is give you 6.6 .6, divided by 10 inch. For the width of the web, this gave you 0.66 inch. The total depth A here is gave you 2.66 because you take this to be 0.66 plus 2 is gave you 2.66. This is good. Now, I guess I should be able to find out the strain in the steam. You have the same distribution that we used to do, right? This give you the datum, and here's the strain distribution. And with that, if you have this, you can solve for C. If you like, this give you like this, because neutral X is actually is giving here. Because this give you C lower case. It's gonna be equal to A divided by beta one. Let's work on this. Here is the C, A divided by beta one. Roughly like three inches in a fraction. Take C over D. You have a fee factor of 0.9. Look at this, C over D 0.26. It's given the right side because it's gonna be C over D. Means that your fee factor is gonna be 0.9 and the steel is already yielding because the strain is gonna be more than 0.05. I understand that. So if you like, you can determine the strain here or we can just refer and say, based on this chart, I'm gonna have a strain more than 0.02, which means the steel is already yielding. So what is next? Let me go back here one slide, just look at this picture. What's next is that I understand how to find out the moment. As we say, it's gonna be CF, ZF plus CW, ZW. Now I need to find out this ZF. How can I do this ZF? Can someone help me here with ZF? Is it uh, acting at the center line of the flange? Yeah, which means it's gonna be how much? Um, so what are 12 inches minus one inch? Yeah, let's give you 11 inches, good. How about this ZW? So it would be um, 12 minus two minus 0 0.32. Exactly, thank you very much, very good. Now let's look at this. Here is ZF, 11 inches, How about this W? It's going to be 12 minus 2, is exactly as you said, because you need to subtract the flange. And then you say minus A2 over 2, the 0.33. That's going to be 9.67. So what do you do next? Just take the moment about the bottom reinforcing. It's going to be CF, ZF plus CW, ZW, multiplied by the fee factor. That's it. And then you put the KF fee. Questions? No, it doesn't matter. CF and CW could be just any values, but what's important, if you add them together, it needs to be equal to the tension and the rebars. Your tension rebar, if you recall, is 180 caps. The way that you have done it, let's say, is give you three square inches times 16, which is FY. For ZW, could you just do 12 minus A divided by two? No. Because A is giving you the entire thing. This is A, right? This is A. And your ZW would go to the centroid of this CW. And this goes right mm -hmm. here. You're gonna have your two forces. Each one of them is gonna have a different moment arm. Okay, thank you. No problem.
Any more questions on this T section? All right, let's try another T section example. What happened? I have taken the previous example and I made this to be three inches. Let's see what this is going to do to our analysis. Depth is giving the same, AS is giving the same. Now you do the calculation for AS. Now you consider the width to be the width to be 32 inches. So I did that. And the gap is 2.2. Exactly the same analysis. Nothing is different. Now what happened? Your compression block depth is giving here. Now this becomes a rectangular section. It is not a T section anymore. So if your A, the compression block depth, is within the slab thickness, you're gonna have a T section, and this gives you a compression force. And this is gonna be your A. This gives you the 2.2. I don't really need to have CW and CF anymore because I'm gonna have just one compression force in the flange. So, okay, let's see what's gonna happen. Here's a V factor. We have the C is gonna be equal to A divided by beta one. Take this divided by D. And the rest of it is gonna be simple. Now, in this case, I don't have this, I don't have this. But I can use that same equation and CW is going to be equal to zero. It's going to be a very simple problem. It's going to be like any rectangular section. Now, this is going to open the topic here. Now, I'm done with this example, just so you guys know. But this is going to open the topic. I'm going to say, if I have a rectangular section like in here, I'm going to go back here in my slides, like in this case, right? Or like in here. I have here a few options if I have any rectangular section, right? Option number one, if the neutral axis happened right in the middle of the flange, somewhere here in the flange, would you call this rectangular section or T-section? Can you repeat the question one more time? If your neutral axis is going to be within the flange itself, would you call this rectangular section or T-section? Rectangular section. Rectangular section. Okay, let me look here. Let me put it here. If my neutral axis is going to be here, you call this rectangular section because area exposed to compression is going to be this area here, right? And this here reminds me with a very big section with the same depth. So here's a big section, right? Here's the entire section of the B. It does give me exactly the same strength. Which means if someone here is giving me a big section like this, I'm going to put here a new section. I'm going to say, here's my section. It's going to be like this. And I know that my neutral axis is going to be right here on the top. I'm going to say, I can lighten this beam. I can make it lighter by taking out some of the concrete in the tension side because I know it's not going to be doing anything to me. This is the reason in bridges. You're going to see a beam like this. Here's going to be the bridge deck or the beam. And then in the middle, they made it hollow. And this can be OK because most likely the neutral axis is going to be right here. So compression is going to be only on the top of the flange. It's going to be here. And it would be good because you're going to make the self weight of the beam is going to be much lighter. So never that you don't need the concrete compression, you can just make it open. And in here, you can put anything in here, right? Piping, ducts, whatever that you'd like to put, you just put it in here. So is this the preferable means for design? Like, is this what people go for when they design typically to have it in the flange? Yeah, exactly. And if the neutral axis is going to be a little bit down here, it's going to be okay also. Because compression is going to be first in the flange and then in this little area of the web. But when the concrete section becomes large, like become big and very heavy, you just make it hollow from inside. Okay. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Yeah, all right, very good. So this gave me the first option. 
Now, where's the second option? I'm going to say second option if the neutral X is going to happen right here. Now, where's the compression force? Is this here rectangular section or T section? Neutral X is going to be here. For the sake of analysis, I'm going to call it rectangular section because I'm going to have just one force. The only case that you treat this as a T section when neutral axis would happen through the web. In this case, you're going to have two forces. So the term here, rectangular section or T section, would come to analysis. It is not about the way it looks because this one here, it looks like, as you're looking here at it, it looks like a T section. So we don't call it T-section or rectangular section based on the look. We call it based on the way that we're going to be doing our analysis. I'm going to have one compression force. I'm going to call it rectangular force, a uh, rectangular section. If I'm going to have like two forces, like what you have been looking here at, right? I'm going to be calling it here to be a T-section. We'll come to the analysis. We're good? All right. Let's see the third example for today's lecture. Here's the third example. Well, it seems that this also is gonna be a T-section, but look what happened to the flange. I don't have a flange. Actually, this is very common beam when it comes to precast beams and pre-stress beams. Usually it is like this, because you need this area here so that you bring another structure member like another beam, it looks like this, and they need this ledge. They need the support like this. So we're gonna have a beam coming like here, another beam coming like this from the other side. So the question is, where's the neutral axis gonna happen or compression block there? If it's gonna happen right here, would you call this rectangular section or T-section? rectangular and it's going to be paced on 7 inch not paced on 17 inch right if it happened right here still going to call it rectangular section one's going to start to come down here i'm going to call it here t section but someone's going to say it doesn't look like t i'm going to say i understand it does look like t but we treat the same as we treat a t section now let's look here at the analysis for this 3060, I have all dimensions and I have four number nine, which means four square inches. You assume that the steel is yielding. And here's your A, compression block depth. You do OAS times FY, four times 60, divided by 0.85. Three is gonna be for 3000. And then you start by using B of seven inches only. You don't use B of 17 inches because you're coming from the top. It gives you 13.45. You say, wow, it's going to be like here. But you know what? The final A depth is going to be slightly higher. Why? Because once you go down, you're going to have wider concrete section. So the concrete here, right? Once you go here, once you go down, the width of the concrete is going to be larger and it's going to provide you the compression you want. Any questions on this, on the concept? Okay, good. So I'm gonna have the same terminology. This is gonna be four inch, and this is gonna be A2, and the total is gonna be A. I'm gonna have here two areas. Now, where's A1? I'm gonna say here's A1, just in case it is not written, right? Where's A2? This is gonna be A2. A1 equals seven times four inches. It's gonna be fixed. A2. It's going to be different because it's going to be equal to A2 lowercase multiplied by 17 inch. Both of them is going to be equal. Once you take this, both of these, multiplied by 0.85 F prime C, it's going to be compression force equal to the tension force. Your tension force is going to be four times, help, four times, six is going to be 240 kips. So, okay. Same steps I've done in the first example, right? Here is CF. One value here is CW. The difference between the tension and the compression of the flange is going to be 168, which is equal to what? F prime C times A2 times 0.85. With that, I have A2. Now, A2 lowercase, you just take this A2 to 66 divided by 17 inch. What's 17 inch is going to be this way. K 
okay, divided by 17. Now it's become 3.89. Look at the total depth. It's going to be 4 plus 3.89 is going to be 7.89. So total depth here is going to be 7.89. But when I did my first round of analysis, what depth did I get? Can I take here? I was receiving 13.45. So if you just do it based on the 7 inch, it's going to be 13.45 from this point, right? That point. 13.45. You can see it here, right? It's going to be right here. But because the effect of this wider beam section, once you go down below four inches, once you go down here, becomes 17 inch. This here becomes much shallower. Now it becomes 7.89. Again, versus 13.45. So let me put here 13.45. So, okay. Before I continue, I'd like you to do comparison between this example and the first example. In this example, when I do rough analysis based on the top flange width, I was able to get to 13.45. Because the width of the beam is getting larger, this A dropped to 7.89, which means it's gonna get reduced. Look what happened in the first example. First example, it was not like this. I started by saying total depth is gonna be equal to how much? 2.2. When I did my analysis, it came to be 2.66. So it came deeper because once you go down, the beam is getting narrower, therefore you need more depth to balance the compression force. Any questions on that? Just that was a quick comparison between the two examples in this sense, in the sense of this A lower case too. Let's move forward here to our example number three. So now I understand this gave be 7.89 for the A, and I guess I should be able also to figure out the C by dividing A divided by beta one. Take here C over D, 386. It says here, the fee factors gave me 0.88 because look at what happened. For 386, your line is gonna be right here. And in a case like this, all what you need to do is just use this equation. You say 0.65 plus the strain in the steel minus this times 2 fifth divided by three. Or if you like to use the C over D, you can just use this equation here, right? So you don't really have to find out the strain in the steel. You can just do it this way. Your C over D, based on this analysis, gave you 0.386. So you see here, one divided by 0.386, subtracting 5 thirds, multiply this by quarter, plus 0.65, it's gonna get you the 0.88. Can go back here one slide, just look at this and say, how much is ZF? I need your help with ZF. Can someone help me? That would be the total depth minus T. Depth is 24 inch. So I'm gonna say it's gonna be 24 minus two. Correct? How about ZW? Help me with ZW, please. So it'd be 24 minus. 24 minus four, right? Minus. 389 divided by two. Pretty good, All right? Now let's see the actual analysis for this. It's right here. 22, 24 minus four minus eight over two. Here we go, 18.06. What do you do next? Fee man, it's gonna be CFZF plus CWZW, and don't forget to multiply by fee factor the point eight eight. Waiting for questions. Yes. All good here. All right, great. All right. Let me bring this back here to you. That was a rectangular section. And then all of a sudden, we added lots of reinforcing, right? 
what happened to the fee factor drop down. And also the strain in the steel was not reaching the yield. Right? The steel is not yielding. So just imagine if you have a T-section and the steel is not yielding, you put lots of reinforcing. Just, you know, in this example here, something that, I mean, numerically is incorrect in here in this example. So what I'm planning to do, I'm planning to correct it this evening and post it. I'm gonna repost it. So I'm gonna be taking this out from the canvas. So if you download this, be sure that you download the new one. Just what happened, the strain in the steel is gonna be maybe slightly higher and this is gonna change the rest of the problem. But the concept is gonna be the same. I'm still back checking the numbers and it seems to me that the strain in the steel is gonna be slightly higher. That was kind versus when you use calculator versus a spreadsheet. So I guess that was a calculator or something. Any questions? All right. Now this could be the second slide set on the same topic. So the one that we covered was number six, right? That was number six, we're done with it. Now it's gonna be number seven, which is number two for the TB. What does it mean by this double reinforcing beam? Double reinforcing beam, it means that you're gonna have top and bottom reinforcing in the same section. So the bottom reinforcing in a positive moment is gonna be taking tension and the top reinforcing will take compression. Here's what happened. This is gonna be the type of forces. So we don't really have new equations, but we're gonna have also a new trick, very similar to the T-section thing. Same equations, tension equal to compression, moment is gonna be equal to Z times compression plus Z times compression, finding out the V factors gonna be the same. You're gonna have C, you're gonna have the beta factor. It's gonna be exactly the same. Again, difference is gonna be the number of forces that you need to consider for compression. Tension force, again, is gonna be equal to AS times, in this case, I'm gonna call it here FS. And usually you assume this yielding, so it's gonna be AS times F1 at the beginning. Now, in this case, I don't have a T section, I just have compression reinforcing. Tension reinforcing is called AS. Compression reinforcing is called AS prime. So usually once you see prime, you know it's gonna be compression. You see this F prime C, this prime is gonna be for compression. C for concrete. Compression reinforcement, even for the depth. Depth to the tension rebars is gonna be D. Depth to compression rebars is gonna be D prime. Okay, now it means I'm gonna have you two compression forces for the simple rectangular section. The first one is gonna be the compression on the concrete. 0.85 A prime C times A times the width B. I'm gonna have another compression, which is in, gonna be in the steam. This is gonna be equal to AS prime, which is this cross section area of AS prime multiplied by FS prime. And of course, you're gonna be hoping that also compression uh, compression C is gonna be yielding. This would be great if bottom is yielding and else is gonna be much simpler. Also, at the end of the day, you need to know that this tension is gonna be equal to C1 plus C2 because total compression is gonna be equal to total tension. And if you're looking for the moment, you need to have this Z1 and Z2, and then you say moment equals C1 times Z1 plus C2 times Z2. And of course, don't forget the phi factor. Phi factor, you can do it if you have C and then you find out C over D and then you go to your chart. Any questions on the concept and the forces? Is the compression from like the compressive strength of steel, is that 
a huge benefit or is it just present for a negative moment and so now we must consider it? No, this is going to be here for the positive moment section, not for the negative moment. Because at the negative moment section, you're going to be adding more reinforcing the top than the bottom. Right. I, I was con yes. so there are two separate sets of reinforcing. Yes. So you can play with the amount of top reinforcing. For example, if I give you here a beam, let me put this here. Here, for example. I can come here and put some continuous rebars and the same thing on the top, right? Yeah, that, yeah. I can have exactly the same rebar. I can put here a couple of rebars in the top, I'm gonna put a couple of rebars. But when it comes here at the bottom, I can add a little bit more rebars. So total reinforcing in the section that I really needed at is gonna be equal to this couple of rebars plus additional two. And come here in the same thing. In the negative, I'm going to be adding also a couple of rebars. So let's say I'm going to be adding here this to be two. I'm going to throw here some numbers two, number six, bottom, continuous. And also on the top, I'm going to have also two number six continuous. Continuous bars, right? Continuous bar means is going to be helping here, right? Now, I'm going to be coming here and adding additional two number six. We're going to say add two number six. And here in the top, I'm going to say, you know what? This is not me add here two number six. I'm going to make him here three number six. Okay. Now, let me inspect the possible moment and the negative moment section. Here's a possible moment, I'm gonna draw it here. How many rebars do you have at the bottom taking the tension force? Can you help? It's like four, right? Yeah, it's gonna be four number six. How about on the top, how many rebars? Two. Two, because you have two continuous, right? So I'm just gonna say, okay, two number six. How about this negative section? How much rebars do you have on the top? Because this is gonna be the main steel, right? It's gonna be how much? Five. Five, it's gonna be five number six. How about the bottom? The bottom right here. It's the two continuous ones. It's gonna be two, two number six. So kind of trying to optimize here my design. Whenever I need more reinforcing, I'm gonna be adding it. So sometimes you have this three bar are just continuous, and then you consider it here, like this example, right? Then you just add a couple of rebars, get it continuous, and you just use them for the compression. Sometimes you need it for strength. So you start to add more reinforcing here because the strength is not enough and you need to add more reinforcing. For example, here, let's say I tried this. I tried four number six, two number six, it's still not good. So I'm gonna say, why don't I just make the three rebars continuous and just add two and two? So in this case, I'm gonna hear five, right? And two, and we'll come to this section, I'm gonna have four and three. So it's gonna be based on the way that you'd like to put the rebars. And of course, you'd like to save. You don't wanna throw lots of rebars. You'd like to save as much as possible. Okay. So it is gonna be like that you, put your layout and the reinforcing the way you want it, and you can play with it. You can have, let's say some people would say, four number six, top and bottom continuous. This can be up to you, right? If it works with you and you think that this is simpler, I mean, I'm talking here about real practice, right? Not uh, homework or exam problem. Professor, can you, are you gonna discuss the, the compression one and two? It seems kind of confusing still. This one? Yeah. Yeah, we're going to have examples. We're going to have, <laughs> we're going to be talking more about it in details, right? The compression force number one here is going to be compression the concrete. And the second compression force is going to be compression the steel because the steel here is exposed to compression. Here's the steel extension. 
And as you see here, it says F prime S uses Gibby FS, but F prime because compression. So this prime is Gibby for compression. I guess I'm gonna stop here and uh, please go ahead and sign out and uh, see you next time. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Professor, can I ask a question regarding, I guess it's the, the yield strength. What? Uh, the yield strength. Yes. Uh, um, I think I'm confusing. So I was redoing the examples to clarify my, my thought process. And you know how we're supposed to compare compare the, the yield strength? Um, well, we assume what it is and then compare it to what's actually happening. Like, why do we do that? Why do we do this? Because at the beginning, we have an assumption, right? I'm gonna put this back again. Give me a second. Sure. In this rectangular section example, if you recall, I assume yeah. the steel is yielding, right? Which means right. the force is giving 142. Where's this come from? AS times FY, correct? Right. Yes. And then I confirmed that the steel is giving yielding, right? And therefore my assumption was good and 6K size good. But when I put lots of reinforcing, like in this example, right? Mm -hmm. And then I assume that the steel is yielding. Right. I obtained here very deep neutral axis depth, which doesn't make sense. So I said something right. is wrong. Oh. So I start to say here, my assumption that the steel is yielding is wrong. So what should I do? Now I need to solve for the strain in the steel and then the stress in the steel. So look here, the stress in the steel is say about 32 KSI. The first assumption that I started with, it was 60 KSI. And it was not getting me anywhere, right? That was wrong. So I said, let me try to solve for it because this is going to be one of the unknowns in this okay. case. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. No problem.